Uh, good evening. I guess I should say to you guys, it's actually late for me. It's about quarter till 12, according to this, but I think that's actually wrong. I think it's closer to midnight. Um, I think my date and time are off on my calendar for whatever reason. But this is Mr. McKeever, and I'm going to be recording for your lesson today for Thursday, or not Thursday, I'm sorry, Wednesday, June 30th, 2021. So without further ado, we're going to talk today about some Newton stuff, right? But go back to good old Fig Newton, I mean, Isaac Newton. So we're going to talk about some old thoughts on motion. Then we're going to talk about Newton's first law of motion, mass, inertia, speed, velocity, and free fall. There will be some formulas on this one. So I would highly suggest that you get a sticky or a three by five card and keep that kind of handy when you're reviewing these lectures so you can write down formulas that you might need when a quiz comes out or a test. And hitting that judge, Bob's your uncle. So if a pool ball is sitting at rest on the pool table, we learned in the last lesson a net force acting upon it is zero because it's at mechanical, right, or static equilibrium. It's not going anywhere. It does have a gravitational pull pulling it down. It also has a support force pushing it up, right? That's allowing it to sit at rest. Barring any wind interference, it's not going right or left. If all of a sudden the pool ball started rolling across the table, you'd have to investigate what forces caused it to roll because something caused net forces not to be zero any longer. That or we'd be calling Zach Baggins to investigate for ghosts because at that point we'd be starting to wonder about ghosts. What this is saying is we know that changes in motion do not occur without a cause, right? Even changes in your own motion do not occur without a cause. Unless you're a rebel, then you're without a cause. So looking back at motion, our first glimpses can be traced back to Aristotle. Is Aristotle, I'm joking, right? Greek scientists who studied motion and divided into types. And you have to remember that in the times that motion was studied in the past, especially in the distant past, science and thoughts like that originally were really pushed and thought to be really heartening that you're studying science, right? And then we get into kind of the Reformation, the Renaissance period, or science again is kind of revered, but not kind of, and the Catholic Church takes over. And then we end up kind of turning our backs to science, right? But Aristotle, you know, during his time period, they kind of revered science. During his time period, though, there were two types of motion thought of, natural and violent. Natural was either up or down, right? And objects seek their natural resting places. So if a boulder is on the ground, that's where it's supposed to be. If smoke is in the sky, that's where it's supposed to be. Heavy things fall, light things rise. The only time circular motion occurred was for the heavens, you know, for when the sun rotated around the earth, which we know wasn't true. These motions were considered natural. So when you heavy things fall and light things rise, those are natural motions. Violent or imposed motions was a result of a force being pushed or pulled. Important thing about defining violent motions that it had an external cause. Violent motion was imparted upon an object. We're starting to get to logic here, right? Objects in their natural resting place could not move themselves. So, you know, Aristotle was like, okay, look, we can push a boulder down a hill, but when it stops, it's at its natural resting place and that's where it's meant to be. Even though it might've been meant to be where it was before it was pushed, we're not even gonna get into the theory of that. So looking back at motion, our first glimpses can be traced back to him, right? It was commonly thought for 2000 years that a force was responsible for an object moving against its nature. So if I'm sitting in this chair, it's my nature to sit in this chair and you would have to push a force on me in order to change that nature. Not too far off, right? The state of objects will not rest unless they're being pushed or pulled towards something. Most thinkers before the 1500 considered it obvious that the earth must be in its natural resting place. The earth simply didn't move and that the sun moved around the earth because they thought the sun was a little tiny object in the sky, right? Not, and the earth was this huge object that was moving, was impossible, unthinkable. So along came Copernicus with the simple concept that the only way that science has made sense was that the earth and other celestial bodies, because they could see other celestial bodies, moved around the sun that the sun must have been massive. And it was so massive that it created its own kind of field that caused the earth and the other planets to move around. This is extremely controversial and people prefer to believe the earth was the center of the universe. I think it sounds familiar. Copernicus worked on a lot of his theories in secret. The first copy of his work, the De Revolution of Arbus, 
reached him in the day of or this that first copy of his work reached him on the day of his death in 1543. He died of a stroke. Interestingly, he was mar- buried in an unmarked grave because this time his his ideas were considered heretical. Right? It's nothing more than a common man from his area. So we now know he was a great scientist. He announced the idea that the moving earth in the 16th century, one of those arguments against the moving earth was consider a bird sitting at rest on top of a tree. And okay, if any of you have ever seen any of the flat earth theories, my head's not going to explode about talking about that, but the same arguments apply now that people were arguing in the 15 and 1600s. And anyway. If a bird is sitting on top of the tree, the bird sees a worm, drops down vertically, and catches it. It was argued that it would not be possible if the earth was moving. Blink, slowly. The fact that birds do catch worms from high tree branches seemed clear evidence that the earth must be at rest. We know a lot more now. Along came Galileo, Galileo, right? The first and foremost scientist of the late Renaissance Italy. It was an Alp spoken in his support of Copernicus. Galileo argued that only if there's only force when friction is present. In most cases in real life, a force is needed to keep an object moving. Otherwise, friction will resist it and stop it from moving. So let's think about that for a second. If you hit the gas in your car and let the car just take off and then let off the gas, eventually the car is going to come to a stop. Well, why is that? Well, it's going to come to a stop mainly because that at that point, the car itself has had friction acted upon it, both wind friction, wind resistance, and also the friction of the tires rolling the road, and there is no force continuing to move it. So that's kind of goes right along Galileo's thought processes here. He demolished Aristotle's assertions of the 1500s. One of Galileo's greatest contributions of physics was demolishing the notion that a force is necessary to keep an object in movement. Of course, it's necessary, but to start it moving, it is. Objects of different weight free fall to the ground at the same time, and a moving object needs no force to keep it moving in the absence of friction. So friction is the name given to the force that acts between materials that touch as they move past each other, right? So if I take these two objects and I rub them together, there is a friction. And actually, you can usually detect a small amount of heat while doing that. It's caused by the irregularities of the surface of the objects that are touching, even very smooth surfaces like ice rings have microscopic irregularities that obstruct motion, right? That's why when hockey's playing, right? And it was so great to see the Vegas Golden Knights make it to the uh, sand, oh wait, never mind. Um, what do they do between periods, right? They bring out the Sambonis and resurface the ice. Why do they do that? Well, because there's now more irregularities in the ice than there were before. And it makes it a lot harder to skate from one end of the ring to the other ring, right? If friction were absent, an object would need no force whatsoever to remain in motion. And this can be seen in outer space. Literally, if you have enough force to overcome the pull of gravity of the Earth once you get into space, and once you get started, say you get started and get past the Earth's gravity and are traveling at 300 miles per second, you would go at 300 miles per second forever until you encountered a different force that would slow you down, maybe the gravity of a different planet, maybe you'd impact into an asteroid. Right? There's no friction in space because there's no wind resistance in space. Force itself is a push or a pull. Inertia is the property of matter to resist changes in motion. It depends upon the amount of matter in an object. It's mass, right? So the more mass you have, the harder it is to change your status of motion. I'd agree with that, right? The heavier you are too as a person, it's harder to change your status of motion as well. Yeah, let me use rolling balls as an example. He took two inclined planes facing each other, started one, started the ball rolling up, and what he found was as it rolled, as it went down, it gained speed, rolled across a flat spot, spot kind of lost a little bit, rolled up the other side, and what he found is most of the time, for the most part, that rolling ball, because these metal balls, would achieve the same height on the opposite side, and then come back down, be a little bit lower, and come back and be the same side over here, And as it lost speed because of friction, it would just stay at a constant kind of rotating motion. On a ball on a horizontal surface with no friction, the ball would roll indefinitely, right? Just keep going, right? So this kind of helped him determine that theory of inertia. 
Then came along Sir Isaac Newton, right? And he homogenized previous research, it means he brought it all together. Often of you hear him getting hit in the head with an apple to falling out of the tree to produce gravity. Well, we really don't know if that's 100% true, um, but it's a great theory on it, right? He started doing heavy research into motion and produced a few of the basic laws of motion. So his first law is pretty much principle today and forever, right? It's a law of inertia. It's a restatement of Galileo's idea that a force is not needed to keep an object moving. He would say objects at rest. So simply put, things tend to keep doing what they're doing or what they're already doing. So an object in motion tends to stay in motion. An object at rest tends to stay at rest, right? Only force will change that state. In the absence of forces, a moving object tends to move in a straight line indefinitely, right? If you toss an object from a space station located in a vacuum, it'll travel forever, right? Um, and there are some theories on this that maybe, you know, with, some, with the problem we're having on Earth right now with the garbage and refuse and stuff like that, could we design a rocket? that would have just enough fuel to break past Earth's atmosphere, design a trajectory to shoot it directly at the sun. Because once it broke Earth's atmosphere, and as long as we plotted the course correctly, it would travel indefinitely until it hit the sun and burn up. Hmm. Interesting theory, at least to me. These are the things I think are interesting. An object at rest tends to stay at rest, an object in motion tends to stay in motion. An object at rest tends to stay at rest, an object in motion tends to stay in motion. That is the first law or the law of inertia. This can even relate to study, going to the gym or simply getting out of bed. Sim think about it. Going to the gym at first is rather difficult. Your resistance or inertia to it is very high. As you continue to go to the gym daily or every other day, it becomes easier and easier to go. It literally supports Newton's first law. But what happens when you miss a day? It's easier to miss the next day. It's easier to miss the next day. You're starting to trend back towards rest, right? If you're throwing a ball up in a car, right? And the law of inertia didn't exist. So if you're driving along a car or your friend's driving a car and you're just throwing this ball up and down in a car, or even just on this moving planet, if the law of inertia didn't exist, as soon as I threw this up, that ball would fly backwards, right? Because the ball and myself are both moving with the earth, right? As these two move together, right, it also allows me to juggle if I want to, right? And I can still catch the balls if I want to. I can do this in a car, and the car is moving, right? But if we didn't have inertia, as soon as I throw this one ball up, this, like, God forbid that it would not be, you know, in front of my head, right? But over here, it would go back to the back window and smack the back window, right? So the law of inertia says that once this ball is moving with the car, it stays moving with the car. So think of this, the force gravity between the sun and the planets holds the planets in orbit around the sun. What happens if the sun went, didn't go supernova, but instead went ultra black and died? Gravitational force, so the, the actual thermonuclear force creating that gravitational pull of the earth toward on the earth dies. What would happen to the earth? Continue off in a straight line forever. And we'll talk about this when we talk about rotational forces, right? It would just keep traveling forever and ever away from the sun. It wouldn't take us long till we're far enough away from the sun that we'd all freeze to death, right? The more mass an object has, the greater its inertia. Think about how big the earth is. How much force would it take to stop the earth from doing that? And then also think about how much force it must take for the sun to enact that pull on earth. And then how much pull the earth has to enact on the moon to act on the moon. Even something as simple as like the space station. The space station is huge. The amount of force required for the Earth to maintain it in orbit is just amazing to me. So the amount of inertia an object has depends directly on its mass, not its weight, right? When we think of weight, we, and this is where we get kind of misconstrued, right? Because mass is kilograms or pounds, Right? Weight is truly the pull of gravity or a force acting upon an object. So really our weight would be measured in newtons more than it is pounds and kilograms. But we've kind of misconstrued them over the years and we kind of avoid using that. But in science, the mass of an object is in pounds and kilograms, right? So if you're 220 kilograms or 220, excuse me, pounds, you'd be hundred kilograms, 2.2 kilograms per pound, right? But we know that from the previous lesson, Earth pulls you to 
the earth, the center of the earth with 10 newtons of force per kilogram. So your true weight would be a thousand newtons, right? Now your weight would be different on the moon and it would be different on the Mars, on the Mars, on Mars. It would be very different on Jupiter where it's just amazing amount of pull pulling you down. So the mass is the measure of the inertia of an object as well. So the more mass you have, the more inertia you have. This makes sense, right? And I like to think about going back to, because um, I'm a huge comic book geek, right? The big thing in Marvel comics for one of the X-Men is the blob, right? The blob, oh, that was not what I wanted to do. There we go. I went way for it, didn't I? There we go. Sorry, I lost the place. Um, the blob is supposedly the unmovable object, right? And then you've got the juggernaut. No, I won't continue that from the meme. Um, the juggernaut is an unstoppable force. So that brings that back, you know, the, in the comic books a lot, you had the, what happens when an unstoppable force meets an unmovable object, right? The blob is said to have generated his own gravitational field. He was that large in the Marvel comic book series, obviously, right? Still waiting for our mutant powers to develop from our vaccines. Can't wait. I'm going to get laser beam eyes. So when we have mass, it's how much atoms make us up. That's really what it is, right? And then we have volume. Volume is the measurement of space and is measured in units such as cubic centimeters, cubic meters, cubic liters, stuff like that, right? Mass in science is fundamentally measured in kilograms. So that brings up the good old thing, what weighs more, a kilogram of feathers or a kilogram of lead? Well, technically they weigh the same. They're both a kilogram which takes up more space would be more voluminous, right? I'm assuming probably that the kilogram of feathers would take up more space, but I mean, I guess you could pack them in pretty tight. So look at that. So which has more mass, a feather pillow or a common automobile battery? Well, clearly the automobile battery is more difficult to set in motion. So it's an evidence that the battery has a greater inertia and then it has a greater mass. But if both of them are the same mass and both came in at 28 kilograms, the masses were equivalent then the inertia would be equivalent. It would take you the same amount of force to move either of them. That's why mass often gets confused with weight, like I said, right? The weight is more about the gravitational pull down, right? Think about it. If we actually recorded, you know, if we, if we recorded our weight the true way we should, you know, if you're 100 pounds, you're about 50 kilograms, you would actually technically be weighing 500 newtons. That wouldn't be so fun to say. Well, how much do you weigh 500 newtons? I guess if we traditionally all went to that, it would make more sense, but initially it would be kind of shocking. So mass is inertia. It's the amount of material in a particular object, particularly in this case, a stone, right? Whether that stone is here on earth, whether that stone is in space, the mass is the same. The amount of atoms making that up is equally the same. Whether it's here, Jupiter, Mars, you know, Xenu, doesn't matter where it's at. The mass of the stone is the same in all locations. The weight of the stone though would be very different, right? Even in different places of the earth, your weight's a little bit different because when you're closer to the core, your gravitational pulls a little bit more. When you're further away from the core, say you're in Denver, gravitational pulls a little bit less, right? Scales that we have actually measure how much pull the earth is pulling on you and converts that back to pounds, measurements of mass. So stone's inertia or mass is a property of the stone, not its location, it's the molecular makeup. Same force would be required to shake the stone with the same rhythm, whether the stone was on earth, the moon, or force-free in outer space. We can define mass as the following, in a way that's following. Mass is the quantity of matter in an object. More importantly, the mass is the measurement of inertia or laziness, right? And you can wait to create or equate this back to patients, right? heavier patients tend to have a little bit more difficulty getting up and moving than patients that are lighter. An object exists in response to any effort made to start or stop it. Weight is the force of gravity on an object. Mass and weight are proportional to each other. In the same location, twice the amount of mass weighs twice as much, right? So if I have a 10 kilogram object and a 20 kilogram object, the 20 kilogram object is going to weigh twice as much because twice as much mass. They are proportional to one another. We learned that one kilogram equals 2.2 pounds. Therefore, one kilogram is pulled to earth with 10 newtons of force at sea level. Therefore, 2.2 kilograms is pulled to earth with 10 newtons at sea level. When you move further away from the core, force becomes less. 
but not by perceivable amount to us as humans. So the interesting thing is the Earth itself moves at 30 kilometers per second. Think about that for a second. Per second, not per hour. That's how fast it's doing. But so does everything on it. The tree, the road, the bird, you, even the air in between us, right? Objects in the Earth will move with the Earth as the Earth moves around the sun. At the same time that we're moving through space, longitudinally, we're also rotating on the Earth at a certain speed, right? So we are constantly in a state of motion. Even things that appear at rest move, right? So if I'm just holding this ball here, if it was truly at rest, it would fly that way because there'd be no speed in the potential, right? But technically, all of us are in also dynamic equilibrium with the Earth because the Earth is moving us, but we're not technically being pushed forward or back by the Earth's motion. So when we describe the motion of the own object with respect to another, we say the object is moving in relative to one another, right? The book is at rest. It's relative to the table it's lying on. It is moving still at 30 kilometers per second relative to the sun. So if you were able to stand up to the sun, hang out at the sun and look at the earth and be able to see a book on a table, it would be moving at 30 kilometers per second. The book moves even faster relative to the center of our galaxy. The space shuttle moves over about eight kilometers per second relative to earth. A racing car than the Indy 500 reaches speeds of about 300 kilometers per hour relative to the track. Unless otherwise stated, the speed of things in our environment are measured relative to the surface of the Earth. So when you get in your car and you have 60 miles per hour, that's relative to the surface of the Earth. So although you may be at rest relative to the Earth's surface, you're moving at about 100,000 kilometers per hour relative to the sun. This comes in handy when we discuss speed, which is the distance an object has traveled based upon the time. Before Galileo, people described things as simply moving slower or fast. That's it. Right? Such vague descriptions are vague. Galileo is credited with first to measure the speed by considering the distance covered and the time it takes. So speed is how fast an object is moving, right? So speed equals distance over time. Kilometers per hour, miles per hour, kilometers per second. It's speed over time, right? So if you travel, right, 60 miles, and you travel that in one hour, you're traveling 60 kilometers per hour. If it takes you a half hour to get there, then technically you're traveling 120 kilometers per hour because you've doubled your speed. So speed equals distance over time. Speed equals distance over time. It's going to have two units. It's going to have a distance unit and a time unit. Kilometers per second, meters per second, feet per second, something like that. We are going to use traditionally in this class, the metric system. So any combination of units can be used here, right? Light years per century is even a possibility, which we may eventually get to. Primarily use the term meters per second because that's kind of what science uses. So a cheetah itself covers 50 meters in a time of about two seconds. So therefore its speed is about 25 meters per second, right? 50 meters divided by two seconds, 25 meters per second. So looking at some approximate speeds of different units, great, a good thrown bowling ball, about six meters per second. Very good sprinter, 11 meters per second. A rabbit, 17 meters per second. A tsunami, 22 meters per second. There's our sprinting cheat at about 28 meters per second. Batted softball and a batted baseball, about 44 to 30, some, you know, 45 to 30 meters per second. So all of that comes into play, right? So with his law of inertia, right, we talked about a force being imparted about something, right? We can impart instantaneous speed, right? The car does not always move at the same speed, right? When you're driving around town, your speed's gonna fluctuate up and down, and up and down, and up and down, right? You can tell the car speed of any car by looking at the speedometer. And what the speedometer is looking at does some pretty complex calculations for what it does, is it knows that how far a roll or spin of your tires are, Right? And then how far that's going to cost your car to travel based upon the time of travel. So it's going to give you your speed at that moment. Right? If you look at your speedometer at this moment, it's giving you your instantaneous speed. It's not giving you your average speed. It's giving you your instantaneous, where you are right now. Right? So what happens if you change the size of your tires? Does that throw off your speedometer? Sure, it can. Right? If you go from like a 13-inch rim and put 20s on your uh, Toyota Prius, 
it definitely affect your speedometer, right? Or if you go the other way, it can affect your speedometer. You go from 19 inch rims down to 13 inch rims. So all of that can affect things. So in a trip by car, the car will certainly not travel at the same speed the whole time, right? If we're going down to California, going down to LA, and we start at 65 miles per hour, we know that by the time we get to LA, we ain't doing 65 miles an hour anymore. <laughs> we be doing two miles an hour with traffic, right? So that's when we look at the average speed, at least I did every time I took a trip, right? I wanted to know how long it took me to take this trip. I don't know if this, I, I, I sometimes have heard people say this is a dad thing. They want to know what their average speed was. How's your average speed for driving? Most cars have an average speed button. I'll tell you what your average speed is by that tank of gas, right? My truck has that. Uh, most of the time, like my average speed is like 12 miles per hour because I'm driving back and forth to school and it's only like six blocks away. So the driver cares about the average speed for the trip most of the time, right? So the average speed is the total distance covered versus time interval. So if it takes you, if you travel 100 miles, right? And in that 100 miles, it took you four hours. So it's total distance covered 100 miles. Time interval is four hours, right? Focus camera, right? So you divide those two out. You've traveled an average of 25 miles per hour. Now, you may have gone 85 miles an hour for a short bit of that, but that meant you also slowed down for a bit of it. You know, when I travel out here to Las Vegas from Pennsylvania, that was one of the things I actually kept track of. I was like, I wonder what my total... So for my total distance, I traveled. So I measured that on my truck and then how long I spent driving. And I was surprised. I thought it was going to work out to be like 50 or 60 miles an hour. But in reality, it worked out to be like 43 miles per hour. Now I was towing a trailer and also we ended up in traffic. That happens. Um, you know, driving through the north part of Texas, I couldn't get through that fast enough. Because, man, that was boring. Same thing with like outside of Albuquerque, New Mexico, Old Mar, Gold. So the average speed is often quite different than the instantaneous speed. Again, at any given moment, you could be going 60, 70, 85 miles an hour, but the average speed is how long it's gonna take you overall. Whether we talk about the average speed or instantaneous speed, we're talking about the rate at which distance is traveled, distance traveled over time. If we know the average speed and travel time, right? The distance traveled is easy to calculate. We know that total distance covered equals average speed Time travel time. It's just changing up that formula, right? We talked about when we did it, average speed equals distance over time. All I did in this formula here was we're trying to figure this out. This is our X, and we know these two. So we know time and we know average speed just doing algebra right now. So if I wanna get this rid of this, I move this over here. So I time times average speed, right? So example, if you, your average speed is 80 kilometers per hour and you're on a four hour trip, your total distance covered was 320 kilometers. Velocity is also known as directed speed. Speed would be a scalar because speed only has a number, right? We talked about that last time. Scalars just have a single number. Vectors, right, like velocity would have a direction, right? So speed is a description of how fast an object moves. Velocity is how fast in what direction. So in physics, velocity is speed in a direction, Right? When we say a car travels at 60 miles per hour, kilometers per hour, we're specifying speed. If we say it's traveling 60 kilometers per hour to the north, then we're specifying velocity. In order to have constant velocity, right? Same thing, if we have constant speed, it means speed is steady, right? Something with constant speed doesn't slow up or speed up, or speed up or slow down, right? Constant velocity means both speed is constant and direction is constant. Most of the times that we travel, we very rarely end up in a constant velocity because we're always kind of changing our vectors by a little bit. Even if you change lanes, you've technically changed your velocity because you've moved. So constant direction in a straight line, right, in a constant speed would be a constant velocity. 
So if either speed or the direction is changing, then the velocity is changing, right? Constant speed and constant velocity are not the same. Constant speed is just staying at the same speed. Velocity also involves direction, right? Body may move at a constant speed along a curved path, but it does not maintain a constant velocity because direction is changing every instant, right? I'm a huge NASCAR guy. I've said this before, right? So we have cars going around NASCAR track here. This is Martinsville. This is Martin Truex's favorite track because Martinsville, get it? So they may have a constant speed. These cars could maintain, say, 180 miles per hour the whole way around the track. Um, I'm not sure what the speed they could maintain consistently around the track is, but that can be calculated too. But if they could maintain 100 miles per hour around the track, let's just say, that would be a constant speed. But every time they go around a corner, right? They're making a left turn, they're making another left turn. Every time they do that, they're changing their velocity because they're changing directions. The only type of way you could really technically have a constant velocity would be a straight line speed in a straight line direction and you can't change your speed so acceleration is the rate at which velocity changes you can calculate the acceleration of an object by dividing the change in velocity by its time we can also change the state of motion of an object by changing speed direction or both so when we want to change the state of motion of an object we can put it in a different direction we can change its speed or we can do both. That would change its constant velocity. So acceleration is change in velocity over time interval. In physics, I mentioned this last time, the term acceleration applies to both increases and decreases in speed, right? So you have a positive acceleration and a negative acceleration. There is no deceleration. I tend to call it deceleration because that makes sense to you guys, but no in physics, there is no deceleration positive and negative acceleration, right? The brakes of a car can produce a large retarding acceleration. It means they produce a large decrease in speed of object. This is called deceleration in the regular world. In physics, this is called negative acceleration, right? If you slam on your brakes, your car suddenly slows down. We'd say it's decelerated in the regular world, but the physics are saying it's making a negative acceleration. Change in direction, right? If we change direction, because acceleration takes that into account, that also affects the acceleration. It's important to distinguish between speed and velocity at that point. Acceleration is the change in the rate of velocity rather than the speed. And acceleration, like velocity, is a vector quantity because it includes a direction or it's directional. So looking at all the following pictures or examples of acceleration. First, the car is speeding up, right? Positive acceleration. The second, the car is slowing down, negative acceleration, it's hitting its brakes, it sees a clip. The third would actually also be a change in velocity or acceleration, or what we call oh crap acceleration, because now it's falling, it's changing directions. So when straight line motion is considered, it's common to use speed and velocity interchangeably. So if you're just going a straight line, not going around curves, not dropping up or down, we typically use velocity and speed interchangeably. When this direction is not changing, acceleration may be directed at the dire uh, expressed as the rate at which speed changes. Speed and velocity are measured in units of distance per time. Right? Acceleration is the change in velocity or speed per time interval. Right? So changing speed without changing directions from zero to 10, 10 kilometers per hour in one second would be an idea. So if we go from stop to 10 kilometers per hour in one second, that would be an acceleration. At that point, we could state that we have changed 10 kilometers per hour second, because it took us one second to get there. If we said it took us two seconds, well, then we'd be accelerating at five kilometers per hour second. I know it's a lot of units there, right? The main reason we're going to talk about this is straight line falling, right? And imagine there is no air resistance and that gravity is the only thing affecting a falling object. Whee! An object moving under the influence of gravitational force is said to be in free fall. The elapsed time that has elapsed or passed since the beginning of any motion is the case of the fall. The acceleration of an object in free fall is about 10 meters per second squared. It's actually 9.8, or we're just going to use 10 because I want to make it a little bit easier for you guys. So 
if I drop this ball from here and it's in free fall, which will, most of our questions will be, right? It's going to accelerate as it falls, get faster and faster and faster and faster, right? So after one second, right? It's gonna be traveling at about 10 meters per second squared. Okay, after two seconds, 20 meters per second squared, right? It's gonna consistently go up as the speed increases, as time increases. The gain in speed per second is the acceleration. So again, as it increases in speed, right? After three seconds, it's now traveling at 30 meters per second squared but its acceleration is still 10 meters per second, so it's gonna keep accelerating until it hits something. In this case, the unit of time occurs twice, once for the unit of speed, and again, for the time interval. That's why it's meters per second squared. So for an object in free fall, it's customary to use the letter G, yo G, to represent acceleration because it's gravity. So in this formula here, we have V equals GT, velocity, equals gravitational pull times the time. V equals AT is what we'll use when we're talking about straight line speed, because we're just gonna, G is just the acceleration. It's just in a unit based upon the gravitational pull of the earth, right? So although the gravity var var varies in different parts of the world, the average value is nearly 10 point meters per second. Again, where accuracy is more important than the value of 9.8, it's actually 9.813, I think, if I remember correctly off the top of my head. But we're gonna use 10 meters in this class just to make it simple. So the constant G for gravity is 10 meters per second squared. The constant G for gravity is 10 meters per second squared. The instantaneous speed of a falling object from rest is equal to its acceleration multiplied by its elapsed time. And this is where I want to make a quick note because I think I forgot to mention this. When I give you a problem on your quizzes or your tests, if I give you a problem that relates to this formula, I'm going to give you the formula. But I'm going to give you two of the variables. So if I have V equals GT, I could give you velocity and you know gravity and ask you for the time. I could give you the time, you know what G is, and I'm asking for the velocity. Any one of those is valid because that's just simple algebra, right? So the letter V represents both speed and velocity. When accelerating, G, right, is multiplied by the elapsed time in 10 seconds. So if we drop this, one, two, and it falls for two seconds, we're gonna say it was about two seconds, so it's probably a little bit faster. The time at that point is two seconds. G is 10 meters per second. That means at the point that it strikes the earth, the point that it struck my floor here, it was traveling at 20 meters per second squared. Not enough to do damage to the floor, right? But let's say I change that and now I climb up on top of the stratosphere. I'm up on the stratosphere and I throw this ball off the top of the stratosphere. When it impacts earth, it is definitely gonna be traveling at a much greater velocity by the time it hits the earth, right? So much so that you could possibly injure somebody at the base, right? That is why you don't let you throw pennies off the Empire State Building or off the top of the Statue of Liberty, stuff like that. Or, you know, it's not a good idea to even throw something out of the top when you're at the top of a roller coaster or something like that. Because you literally can injure somebody with how fast that object will be growing when it strikes. So again, G is the gravitational constant, 10 meters per second squared. Or 10, meter, right, 10 meters per second squared. And time, right? Time is just seconds, typically. So if a falling object were somehow equipped with speedometer, each of the succeeding seconds, it would fall and increase by about 10 meters per second. So one second, 10 meters per second, two seconds, 20 meters, 30, 40, 50, but until it gets down on the bottom, until you're at like, you know, if you're at you know, 10 seconds could be 10 times the time, right? So all of that comes into play. Now we consider an object being thrown straight up, right? So it moves up for a while, stops, and then comes back down. At the highest point when the object is changing directions from upward downward, its instantaneous speed is zero. So at the, the apex of my throw, that ball is at zero. I should have been paying attention. Now it's all the way across my floor. Boom, boom, right? At the apex, its speed is zero. It's going to stop and change directions. 
During the upward part of this motion, the object is going to slow down at the same rate of speed it would fall down with. So technically, in order for me to even throw this upwards, I have to overcome that 9.8 meters per second negative acceleration of gravity. Otherwise, it'll never leave my hand, right? If I don't, it's not going, right? If I, right? It's not until I put some force into it that it actually flies up. Right, so the object is accelerating because velocity of changing. So how much does the speed decrease? Well, the same thing it's going to increase when it starts falling back down, that 10 meters per second. So if we were able to measure this, right, and watch it go up for one second, it's going to go up. It's going, that means I had to accelerate it at 10 meters per second. It's going to go up until it hits zero, come back down at 10 meters per second. So how far does an object fall and travel within the first second? At the end of the first second, the falling object has an instantaneous speed of 10 meters per second. The initial speed is zero. At a second, right, we're at 10 meters. The average speed is five meters per second, so it's fallen about five meters. For each successive second of free fall, an object is gonna fall a greater distance than it did in the previous seconds because it's gonna speed up. At the end of the one second, a rock's fallen five meters. At the end of two seconds, 20 meters. Three seconds, 45 meters. The distance forms a mathematical pattern. So at the end of a time, the object from falling from rest has fallen a certain distance, d. So d is for distance, t is for time. We know that, right? So he came up with this law uh, that helped us figure it out that for to figure out how far an object has fallen, you're going to take one half times the gravitational constant, g, 10 meters per second squared, times the time squared. So what is this saying? So like I said before, let's just figure this out for one second. So one half gravitational constant is 10 meters per second squared. And for one second squared, one squared is one, right? So that's going to that's gonna leave one when we pull the that one times 10 meters per second squared. We have second squared over here. So that's going to cancel out our second squared. So what we have is one half times 10 meters. That means that it's fallen for five meters. So let's take that a step further. So let's go, you know, distance equals one half GT squared. Now let's say that the object has fallen for 15 seconds. Right? So let me get up my calculator here so I have it up. So I have my calculator up here so I have it. All right, so we're going to say that it fell for 15 seconds. We have one half, 10 meters per second squared. It's 15 seconds. That's squared, don't forget. So we come over here and we go 15 squared is 225. So it equals one half, 10, 225 seconds squared. That's gonna cancel those two out. So we're gonna have 10 times 225 and then times one half, right? So times 10, divide by two. So at the end of 15 seconds, an object has fallen 1,125 meters in free fall. That's pretty fast. So that's how far it's traveled, the distance it's traveled. Could we also calculate its speed at that point or its velocity? Well, we know that velocity just equals GT. V equals GT or V equals AT if you're talking about that. So we know G, 10. We know it's time times 15 seconds. So that means at that 15 second mark, that rock is now falling at 150 meters per second. Now, if that rock was larger and had a large mass, it's going to create quite a crater at that point, right? Think of something like, when, I don't remember, a few months ago, we were worried there was a asteroid that was coming towards Earth that was about the size of a small car. 
and we were worried about where it was going to impact in case it didn't break up in our atmosphere. And I think it finally impacted somewhere over the Pacific, if I remember correctly. But say that same asteroid impacted your house. And even by that, let's just say at that point, the asteroid has shrunk down to the size of this ball. Even this ball at that size is going to create a tremendous crater, right? There are some concerns already about warfare for this because theoretically, let's just think about it. If we have an international, if we have a space station, a wartime space station that is orbiting Earth, and you don't even have to put warheads on that space station, you just put something like a tungsten rod or a titanium rod, and you're able to fire that titanium rod with precision at the Earth. And it's able to avoid most of the friction, which it would be depending on its size, right? By the time that titanium rod would strike Earth, it would have enough force to be pretty considerable to just a bomb or something like that, which can be terrifying to think about. Because all that is is just, excuse me, a rod of metal. So we definitely will use these formulas, right, in order to calculate free fall. Right? The same objects apply to any accelerating object, whether the object's initial speed is zero, the acceleration is constant, the velocity and distance traveled, right? So if we talk about straight line speed, we can use the same thing as long as we just substitute GN for the acceleration of the vehicle. Okay, so if I'm going to give you this and I say the vehicle accelerated at 10 meters per second for five seconds, what is its current velocity? You should be able to calculate that. If I say that the vehicle accelerated at 10 meters per second squared, and it did so for 10 seconds, you can try calculate the distance it's traveled based upon having just these two formulas alone. So if we drop a feather and a coin right now, the coin will reach the floor faster than the feather, even though they're falling at the same speeds. Well, why? Because of air resistance, right? We have air resistance here, right? But in a vacuum, we have one of those vacuum tubes with this, the feather and the coin fall side by side at the same acceleration where there's no gravitational resistance at G, right? That means the feather and the coin accelerate equally when there's no air around. In many cases, the effect of air resistance is small enough to be negligible or neglected, right? Air resistance noticeably slows the object of things with large surface areas like falling feathers, pieces of paper, but takes less notable effects on motions of more compact objects like stones and baseballs or bullets. Right, one of my uh, redneck family's favorite thing to do is go out and shoot bullets up into the air. I don't know why, because the bullet eventually has to come back down. Not the smartest thing in the world, right? So Uncle Bob lost his finger. So with negligible air resistance, falling objects can be considered falling freely. I'm not going to make you calculate in air resistance. Take a sigh of relief. If I was doing a more uh, in depth physics class, yeah, we would do that. But this is just conceptual. This is the basics of physics. So acceleration is the rate at which velocity changes itself. Don't mix up how fast with how far, right? How fast, acceleration, how far, distance, right? One of the most confusing concepts encountered in this book is acceleration or how quickly does velocity change? What makes acceleration so complex is the rate of a rate. Right? It's confused with velocity, which is just a rate. Acceleration is not velocity, nor is it really even a change in velocity because it also has a vector, a direction. So we have review questions here that I want you to go ahead and review through. I'm gonna go ahead and get through them here real quick just so I can get to the end of the PowerPoint. All right, so we are a little bit behind here, but we'll make up that time, don't worry. Um, I think I'm like a half a lecture behind, but that's not a big deal. We can make that up very quickly. But this is gonna be the lecture for today. So this is gonna be the lecture for your day of your practical exam in the net. So by now, then when you're watching this, I hope that you've had a very, very good experience with your practical. I hope you've done well. If not, well, we'll sit down and talk about it. We'll see if we can get you better and get you through it, okay? But otherwise, this is Mr. McKeever. I'm going to be signing off. It's, I don't even know what time at this point. It's late. So I will talk to you guys tomorrow in Anatomy Lab. Have a good night.